With increasing urbanization, an expanding economy, and a growing population, India is one of the world's fastest developing countries. In its race to develop, India will face many challenges over the coming decades, but perhaps none will prove more pressing than water. Water is already an issue for many Indians. In rural areas, 22% of the population must travel half a kilometer or more to get water, and supply in urban areas can be intermittent at best. Sanitation facilities are decrepit or lacking across much of the country, and pollution chokes some of India's greatest water bodies, including the Yamuna River, which provides some 70% of Delhi's drinking water. Agriculture may pose India's greatest water challenge. 90% of India's water is used for agricultural purposes, but some states are already facing water supply and scarcity issues that threaten their long-term agricultural productivity. The implications are clear. As it continues to develop, India will need to find more water to feed its growing population. So you're looking at a large-scale deterioration of the land available for agriculture and the groundwater resources in the entire country. This is a major disaster. Uh, you, you cannot see a way by which there would be food security if this continues. You cannot see a way by which there would be water security if this continues. And energy is imported in India. It's one of the largest importers of coal for energy production, electricity production in the world. Um, they could not sustain producing electricity at the, the rate that's going to be needed to go down to deeper and deeper groundwater resources. So that's the disaster in the making. The epicenter of India's looming water and agriculture crisis can be found in the country's north. For decades, farmers here have been tapping the region's groundwater to irrigate their crops at unsustainable rates. From 2002 to 2008, NASA's GRACE satellites found that water tables were falling by as much as a foot a year in parts of the Northwest. In the state of Gujarat, water tables are now as much as 600 feet beneath the ground, putting local aquifers at risk of saltwater contamination. Unfortunately, in its efforts to support the agricultural sector, the government has helped fuel overuse by providing subsidized electricity to farmers to power the pumps necessary to bring water to the surface. Today, securing enough water to irrigate crops has become both a challenge for many farmers and a financial burden on the state. Now, once water tables start to get to 300, 400, 500 feet, unless you are using the water extremely efficiently, and unless you are using the energy extremely efficiently, the cost of energy can start to become comparable to the income currently the farmers make from growing these crops. With support from the PepsiCo Foundation, in 2008 the Columbia Water Center, part of the Earth Institute, initiated a pilot project to examine the water energy crisis in North Gujarat. Focusing on the Kukurwada subdistrict, researchers began surveying local farmers and analyzing the area's agriculture, hydrology, and energy policies. They soon came up with a novel hypothesis. Could giving farmers a financial incentive to conserve electricity and therefore pump less water help slow groundwater depletion rates? Yeah, so the questions that were paramount to us were, okay, so there is a food security goal for the whole country. What does that mean in terms of water supply? Could you achieve that food security goal by improving irrigation application in the field? Could you improve that if you insisted that you would not give free electricity? Uh, could you maintain farmer incomes if you decided to achieve sustainability in water and energy? So these were the things we were interested in. In Gujarat, the gov state government was somewhat more progressive and their fiscal burden on the electricity they are supplying for free to the farmers was significantly greater. So we were able to convince them that let's look at how energy price reform could be done. Could we pay farmers against their current consumption to save water and hence energy? And does this translate into positive financial benefits for farmers as well as for the government? Working with the Gujarat government and the regional utility company, in April 2011, the center implemented its incentive scheme with a group of 83 farmers. Participants who were able to reduce their electricity use below established baselines would be eligible for a rebate. To help them cut their energy use, scientists began introducing farmers to techniques and technologies for irrigating their crops more efficiently, including a low-cost tensiometer, a device used to measure soil moisture and prevent overwatering, designed especially for the project. We are focusing more on what the farmer can do at the field level, perhaps optimal choice of crop, 
optimal choice of spacing of the crop, optimal choice of when to irrigate. We are looking at the use of information through sensors such as tensiometers to allow farmers to make decisions themselves as to when to irrigate and how to reduce the use of water. Perhaps hindered by a heavy rainy season and a conservative pricing model, no energy savings were recorded in the first year of the project. However, many farmers did receive rebates during some months and crop yields were unaffected. One important early milestone was the strong community response to the program. Almost three quarters of the farmers invited to take part in the pilot agreed to do so, and many others expressed an interest in participating as the experiment continued. The common story that everybody tells is that farmers will never agree to being metered and to uh, priced water. And what we are learning in Gujarat is that both of those are untrue. Documenting that enthusiasm is important because the biggest hurdle was perhaps not technical but psychological. And so showing that this is a approach that is favored by farmers is the first step. As the project continues over the next two years, the team plans to test other low-cost water-saving strategies in addition to tensiometers at project sites. Methods such as optimized crop choice and cultivation, hybrids, and sprinkler or drip irrigation systems could all help produce more substantial savings in subsequent years. We are hoping, and I think the government is keen on this as well, is how these lessons that are learned can be distilled to be brought to a higher level for a wider adoption. Hopefully this can be adopted more widely in Gujarat, maybe lessons learned in Gujarat can be shared by other states and other states can also adopt in some appropriate form the lessons learned from this work. Ultimately, the project will seek to develop water-saving strategies that could be applied across the region, perhaps even at the national level. But for now, the path in North Gujarat seems clear. Curb the over-extraction of groundwater, improve agricultural water use, and safeguard both farmers' livelihoods and national food security. We think that the solutions are not that hard. The problems are complex. There are many interrelationships between social, political, and physical attributes and climate with regard to these issues. But, uh, but I really do genuinely feel that there are three or four relatively straightforward things that need to be done that will solve the problem. Providing an incentive to conserve that is backed up by knowledge, information on how to conserve can be beneficial both for livelihoods as well as for the uh, long-term sustainability of the region.